Dolly Deadly was the new girl. Most new girls are a little intimidated at first. They keep their mouths shut. The young girls loved her, but not us older girls. We hated her! And now I am back for my revenge. Party's over. Faces of death. Poltergeist. Predator. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Squirm. Evil dead. Flowers of flesh and blood. The thing. That's the material. Night of the Living Dead. Psycho was the first film that I saw that was, you know, terrifying. That was whenever that was in the early 60s. We don't really know, but it's Tony Perkins in a wig and he has a big butcher knife and Janet Leigh is taking a shower and he rips open the shower curtain and he stabs her. We don't really see it, but the editing makes it appear that we stab her and edited with her eye. And that was probably the first time I remember being really scared. I was in third grade and I was going to sleep over and I brought over the original first poltergeist. And there's a scene where one of the ghost hunter guys like rips his face off in the mirror. It's a little cheesy now, but it scared me to death. Like I kind of watched it in between my fingers and, but it kind of gives you an adrenaline rush. And, and it's also just the fact that I was so young, I kind of knew that I probably shouldn't be watching that. I have this memory of seeing Predator on television it was uncut, and you've got these guys getting their limbs blown off. Really nasty and gory, and it just really stuck with me. I hadn't really seen any kind of movies that had that sort of content in them, and it just stuck out to me like, whoa, there's, there's movies out there like this. I couldn't sleep for days. I had constant nightmares. I, I still have a little bit of P PTSD from it. It was an old 70s movie, and the name of the movie was Squirm. It was about a bunch of killer worms that came out of the ground. And oh my god, that movie just freaked me out so bad. It was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. I'm not into gore that's exploitative, gore for the sake of the gore, but I really do like seeing it treated the same way as a painter would treat red paint. My parents let me watch a lot of gory movies growing up, or horror movies in general, more so my dad. Uh, he loved George Romero, so... I'm pretty sure the like goriest movie I saw at an early age was probably Night of the Living Dead. My fascination with like death and creepiness and blood uh, just started developing and wanting to see more of it. Flowers of Flesh and Blood and Aftermath at the same time. And I think I kind of got into it through the metal scene, since metal and gore are quite intertwined. It was absolutely disgusting watching, you know, this... Uh poor Japanese woman being chopped off into, into pieces, but we had a good time of it. They're cutting the limbs, and I was quite surprised how it real it actually looked. You just want to keep escalating it. 
it just never disgusted me. And I think that's what kind of made me interested in it. It was actually though, I was a lot younger, a early teenager. We got a hold of it at the video store and that was one of the first movies I remember that just how extreme the, the blood was spraying out everywhere. And it was just, it was kind of comical. It was just so extreme and crazy. Still to this day, like I look for movies to try to get that same feeling that I got when I was younger and the first time I ever saw that, it was just like that, nothing you had ever seen before. Just like with any other great horror film or a uh, legacy of horror films, you have films that you always whisper about. You have films that you always talk about. And uh, the first one that I ended up seeing at that young age was Faces of Death. I'll never forget the monkey's brain scene when they crack open the monkey's skull and they start scooping it out. And it seems so real. To that day, it changed the way I saw horror. It changed how my world saw film and horror and violence and everything. And it would really kind of lead in to be a therapeutic aspect of me. It really impacted me that much at such a young age. And it was really incredible and it never has left me. My first gory film that really freaked me the hell out was The Thing, the, the John Carpenter one that I saw when I was like 12, something like that. And watched it in this dark basement at my great aunt's house. And I don't know why these conservative, nice people were letting us watch this movie. I don't think they knew what it was, but it creeped me out enough. I had to get up and leave the dog with his face splitting open. But at the same time, I was completely fascinated because it was just so weird and over the top with the, the effects that they had. It scared me, but I went back downstairs to watch it, even after I ran out of the room. Oh my God, it's like, it was like, yeah. oh. you know, you're holding this in your hand and like, this is really bad. You it's know it's going to be bad. And you can't wait to get home and put it in. There was something, because you couldn't just get online. Being in England, a lot of those movies were banned when I was over there. So when I first came here, the first thing I did was go to a movie store and rent all the, like, right. the, the, the Evil Dead, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, all those movies. Well, speaking of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is a great example, that came out in 74. I was 10 years old, the older teenagers talking about that movie. And like and just hearing the stories and seeing it in little things in monster magazines when you were a kid. Once it was in the theater, of course, being 10 years old, you were too young to go see it. They had one copy of Texas Chainsaw Massacre that was always out. And then one day I got lucky and it was there. And I remember I was just freaking out like, oh my God. And the guy rented it to me. And I remember going home on my skateboard. <laughs> and it was so exciting. I remember getting home and like, and like it was just the most... The greatest moment ever, you know. I finally like, got so it. So nervous, your hands are shaking. I'm in the club now. Yeah, this, this old, the old VCR, you push the thing. Yeah. <laughs> the big machinery of it, putting the tape in. Yeah. The good old days. The and like, and, and, and sitting there, just like, you know, waiting for it to come on, and then finally getting to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You know, to pull that up and watch it and see Leatherface come out for the first time. Like, what the hell? It's, it's stuff you never forget. You know, that's what you remember. And that's what's fun about it. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. Could have just said it's fun. It could have just said, hey, we like it. <laughs> I remember when I was younger, I always heard that, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, was banned and oh, it was so horrible and violent and bloody. And I watched it for the first time and I was like, that's it? What's, what's so horrible about it? Uh, I think a lot of films that actually have been banned are usually films with rape and sexual violence. I think it should be up to the people to watch the movie or not. I don't think that the country should say, okay, yeah, this movie should be banned because there's too much violence. It's not up to them. It's up to the persons watching it to decide that. Most of the time, they just banned everything. And now it's the first thing you want to do is put, banned Different. in 37 countries but, and try right. to sell it. But, <laughs> but there, growing up there, and just knowing, because I read a lot of comic books, and the comic books had you know a lot of movies that were out you know right. and advertising the movies and it's just like and some of the classics you just knew but it was frustrating because you know you couldn't get to see them the exorcist that freaked people out because it dealt with sin the devil you know um religion a lot of people are religious and so that scares the shit out of them um i think people were like fainting the focus was a little girl who was demonized, or whatever it is, and you know she spits and yells dirty words and turns her head, and is that was pretty. That really was one of the earlier things that I remember. In the scene where she throws up all the green of vomit, <clears throat> that was a big deal. 
Like it doesn't seem like Back a big then, deal now. Yeah. But have you know when she that huge thing of green projectile hitting the you know the nobody had side. ever seen anything it was like, like that. that. Was like people were were freaked out over that. I mean, cool. I remember people. I remember like being a little kid and being in the market and the cashiers talking to customers like, "Oh my god, did you see that?" <laughs> but they had to they watch it and they, they shouldn't have watched right, it. Right, and they couldn't even sleep. They're like, right. you know, they could. They had to sleep with the lights on. There really hadn't been anything quite like that. So they're seeing like you know Reagan's head spinning around and like saying, "Jesus, fuck me." That's gonna scare people. You don't expect you know grown-ups to be scared but when grown-ups are scared you're the little kid like, yeah like, i must what? be really scared like, what the hell happened in that movie you know but mom that's probably the best did you see that movie yeah the best like, word you're sitting there with guards. oh my god i couldn't believe it. you know and people were just like they were blissed holding the cards <gasps> <gasps> but they were just like, blown away and like that stuff that seems tame now yes yeah. it terrified them they were people were scared there's already a market for nudie cuties or, you know, oh, we're going to we're going to go take a scientific exploration of the nudist camp as an excuse to watch naked people on a on a big screen. But it, it occurred that nobody had seen nobody was doing that with nasty stuff with violence and gore and like John Waters. No further questions. No further pictures. I have spoken. They had an impact on audiences with their more gory and edgy stuff because audiences were not jaded. They were not used to it. With the gore films being introduced, it was like a jump. It was definitely reflective of the times. Blow it out your ass! The sexual revolution and everything that was going on and civil rights revolutions and people were changing. So we were no longer pretending that we were all in Ozzy and Harriet land. We were being who we wanted to be. Peter Jackson's early work was very consistent. Dead Alive is actually so well done that it was the only film that I have seen in the past 10, 15 years where I actually had to put it on pause and go for a walk. The ones that stand out to me are the funny ones, like Brain Dead, you know. Right. Uh, movies like that just go crazy with the gore, but they can do that because they presented it as, as in a funny, more spoofy way, so I guess they've been allowed to get away with more. Something happened along the way in the 80s that changed everything with Gore because then we went into more of the main figures that were that would become the icons now, but main horror nightmares brought to life in Jason and Freddy and Michael. And they were able to do really terrible things. But then, in the same breath, Marcus Cook is doing with Unearthed Films Bloodshock and American Guinea Pig. And that kind of stuff right there is so much more gory and brutal and bloody. And that could have never been thought about in the 90s. It probably would have been thought about in the 80s, but never dreamed in the 70s. So guess what? Different decades, different availability, different minds. I, I'm noticing that as horror movies are becoming embraced, the gore factor is getting higher and higher. And it, it's gotten to the point now where I'm just looking forward to the next film that's going out. There's still some things that I have yet to see, and I'm hoping eventually people will cross those lines and push those envelopes, but if people aren't willing to go that far, then maybe that'll give me an opportunity in which I can take it there. And if I can't take it, I'm hoping that the next generation of filmmaker can bring us somewhere new and exciting. The element of fear and torture and being afraid of things like that, for me, watching Cannibal Holocaust for the first time, uh, first of all, it just has a beautiful soundtrack, and that juxtaposed with like all of this really terrifying imagery uh, is really fascinating for me to watch. We all have a fascination with the past. We all have a fascination with things we don't understand. We all have a fear for them. And to watch Cannibal Holocaust, to sit back and say, you know what? This film is really fucked up. This film is uh, hurting animals. This film is showing incredibly graphic gore and practical effects. It's exploiting people. There are times where we're all sitting back and we're angry or we're frustrated or we're sad. And we go, yeah, I really want to get rid of my boss. Or, oh my God, I can't take my spouse whatsoever. And you see these things on TV. You see these things on film. So you have that safety of knowing I'm not going to do it. But... There's always that idea, and someone else has done it, so I feel better being a part of what they've done. Cannibal Holocaust was such a, a, a unique and inspiring movie for a lot of people. It, 
I, initially, when it first came out, it was the rarity of exposure. They want to shock their viewers. They want to shock themselves. They want to see how far they can go. Uh, well, I do think that Cannibal Holocaust uh, went over the line when killing real animals. That's something I'm quite against in, in general. And sometimes you see something that's real and you're not really used to it and it looks fake. And you're just like, oh, that, that, that's fine, but it's real. These movies have been around for decades. I, I think the draw to them in particular is they're considered classics or hallmarks of the genre. And if anything we've learned here in the United States of America is that exploiting people, getting as much as you can, and really taking it to the umpteenth degree is something we've been great at for decades. Getting a hold of Necromantic and reading about it and knowing nothing about it, never seeing clips of it online, and, you know, running over to Jerry and, you know, we got to watch this, you know, it's been banned in all these places. There's, you know, it's crazy. Everybody's saying it's one of the craziest movies ever. And I think we all have that threshold in our head of what we can tolerate. And we want to push that and see if we can break ourselves, if we can handle it, if we can, you know, if we got to cut it off, if it gets too crazy. You know, we're pushing our mind to see what we can handle. A lot of times it's like the gory movies for the sake of just being gory. I think the notoriety, like, you know, everyone's always talking about them. They're kind of taboo, you know, so. Earn your horror stripes. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's basically it. Just, you're trying to uh, prove you're actually a real horror fan, I guess. And in the community, everybody tries to one-up each other. It's yeah. like, oh, I've seen this, this, and this. Well, have you seen this? And then, yeah. you know, somebody passes you, you know, a black cover, you know, VHS or DVD yeah. of, well, this, this is crazy. You're not going to be able, you know, to watch five minutes of this. What I saw it was uh, this idea of extremes. Like, what's the most, like, crazy thing that you can come up with? It might even be the final movie. We see this flash of one of the traps that Jigsaw set up, and it's a room full of lawnmower blades. <laughs> something very appealing about the grotesque and extremes, seeing how far you can take something narratively and push it and make it strange and weird and engaging. When we're brainstorming a movie, the, the, we spend a lot of time coming up with the most fucked up shit we can think of. You gotta come up with the next best thing. You gotta come up with a new way to shock people. You gotta be original. We're so exposed to it. You know, that's why movies have gone the way they have. I mean, you know, we do. We sit around and think of, like, trying to think of the nastiest thing we can do. Somebody thinks of something really fucked up, and you're just like, oh, my God, what the hell did you think of that? Yeah, that's but gross. It, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Right. How are we going to do it? You know, and then you think of, you know, you know, a way to pull it off. <laughs> better them than me. Uh, if somebody else is dying, then by, you know, it's probably not you if you're watching it. Look. Let him go, Cougar! Your wish is my command. It is this idea of uh, there's a part of us that is almost evolved to, to see death. If you were not comfortable being able to see animals dying, then you would not, your ancestors would not have survived very well in a time and in an environment where you had to kill animals in order to survive in this uh, pre agrarian society. And so there's this part of the brain that's maybe not getting stimulated because it's there for the purpose of seeing death. You eventually become almost desensitized to the fact that you've seen so much violence and so much horror. And I have to say, in the most recently movie I just watched was The Belko Experiment. There were so many just outlandish death scenes. When I left the movie, it, the way it made me feel, it was just like, I don't really feel bad for these people. I've I, I just become so desensitized from the violence and the gore and stuff that I've watched over the years. From early on, there's part of us really into the concept of your own mortality, like death. I know when I was a kid, just seeing skeletons was really cool, and I didn't really know why I was attracted to them, but there's just something about the human body and the awareness that one day you will die. To get like a, a little peek, you know, at, at what's pretty much waiting for everybody. I think it's just human nature. Yeah, movies is a completely... Yeah, I think the movie side of it, it's more like you have your adrenaline junkies who, you know, why do they jump out of planes? Why do they bungee jump? I think everybody 
who's into gory stuff, they have a threshold in their mind and it's like, can I, can I max out that threshold? Can I hit that? Is there something I'm going to watch that, you know, somebody gives you a tape that they say, you know, has been banned in, you know, a bunch of countries and it's the, you know, goriest thing they've ever seen and it looks real. Can I handle that? Can I make it through it? Am I going to have to cut it off? It's just, it's kind of just something you get a thrill out of it. When you're with a lot of other people, there's a reaction. You get to see other people go, oh my God, or, oh, you know, how can they do that? And then, you know, you kind of feed off each other's energy. Yeah. So it, it kind of makes it fun sometimes, you know, watching this disgusting stuff. There's that art form of how did they do it, where you're watching something and they have such good practical effects or gore effects. And you're sitting there wondering, like, how did they make this possible? How does it look so real? Because, I mean, none of us have experienced this, so we don't know what it really mm -hmm. looks like. But yeah. like what Bureau is doing with the new American guinea pig, it's a whole nother way to look at just a different art form. Movie making. Yeah. Pretty much. Soaked in blood. You understand that there's times in our lives where we deal with high emotion, high anger, rage, where we're willing to do things to ourselves as well as others. Um, but we never reach the level of killing people. And when we watch things like um, horror throughout the last 50 years, let's say, especially uh, films in the 1980s, we live vicariously through. You ever get cut off in traffic? You know, you get that little urge that you wish you can just kind of chase the dude down, grab him by his throat, <laughs> and just, you know, hurt him a little bit. So I think that is kind of like an outlet. You know, I'm not saying it's like a you know, a fantasy or anything. I'm sure maybe for some, for some people it is, but I think in, for a lot of people, there's this, you know, we live in a civilized society for the most part, and we're always controlling, suppressing a lot of, I think, natural urges, right? Like this anger, you know, it's the, that anger that could probably take us to do, you know, some really disgusting things. And um, you get to kind of let loose vicariously, you know, live through, someone else doing them. And that's why we have, you know, we have True TV, we have uh, ID TV, we have all kinds of true crime TV shows. And now, to in a sense, it's an art form to watch what happens to these people. And you're helpless to do anything about it. So when you watch it, you sit back and you're kind of taken back about the, the colors, uh, Suspiria with the colors, the gore. <laughs> Friday the 13th, where Jason pushes the guy with the wheelchair down the steps. I mean, these are all terrible acts to watch. But there's an art to it. There's a curiosity. There's a vicarious aspect to it. Even though you know it's not real, um, there is still that fundamental brainstem part of, of your mind that starts freaking out and going, oh my God, this is danger. Get out, run. You still get that little tiny voice in the back of your head going, scream, you're about to die. Something's about to eat you. <laughs> Our genetic disposition is against such things as murder and bloodshed because our biological imperative is to move the species forward and to propagate it and unfortunately things like murder and executions are the exact opposite. Hardly anything scares us anymore so a lot of the times when something is over the top or really gory I don't think it's because we're really getting in touch with a, a death thing at that point unless it's like a vengeance thing. You and I have unfinished business. Like we're seeing some jerk just get it, and there is something so satisfying about that. Death versus gore, or just violence in movies. Oh, that what you done to me! Oh, shit! The facing our fears thing when we're children starts it a lot for a lot of people. Plus there's that adrenaline rush of, <gasps> I just got the crap scared out of me. Oh, I'm still alive. Like a roller coaster. You don't really want to see like dead people smeared all over an apartment, but you'll watch movies like that, you know, because you know it's like it's like it's weird too. I don't know if it's because if it's a relative or something, but you you go to a funeral and it's like creepy. You don't want to look in the casket; it's scary. It, it is. It's creepy, but you like you you. But there's something in movies that because maybe subconsciously you know that you are safe. But you can watch all this horrible stuff and, and feed that. Not have that, any of the consequences. Um, right. And it's like you kind of feed that fascination with it without actually having to, you know, it being real. You can turn it off and, and, go, to the, and go to the kitchen and make something to eat. Right. You know what I mean? But you watch it. I, 
your your brain obviously too releases chemicals when you when you get into that frame of mind like maybe it's just something like that that you just crave it it's like um it's like anything else it's like roller coaster rides you know it's that maybe just that feeling that you get feels so good that you just keep coming back for more and like you'll get some really really nasty stuff and when i mean nasty i mean it's not nasty like even like sexual or porn it's like like the really 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 messed up gore stuff and you're watching it and it's, it's like almost like you you feel like you you shouldn't be watching it like it's almost right. like you feel dirty right <laughs> like it's naughty right. it's like you're watching it and you're going i shouldn't be watching it's like this. a fetish I it's like be, having yeah. a fetish for something that you don't talk about it but you know there's got to be hundreds of people out there that feel the same right. way you know it's just it's just like that it's like fetishes and roller coaster rides Spectacle is a big deal. It's a huge deal in society. And, and I had mentioned before, violence is a really great aspect of spectacle. You know, car crash, uh, think of a NASCAR. Well, there were horrific crashes, and yet there's really like probably 200,000 people in the stand and millions of people watching it. And I'm not sure about this, but I think people go to NASCAR to see a terrible, a terrible event. That's the cool thing. There's, it's the kind of, it's, I, I, it's a, it's, it's very titillating. I think if it doesn't happen to you, it's very, very stimulating. People watch these things to almost validate how unevil that they are. You know, you see something fucked up like cannibal Holocaust or something, and you're like, well, I don't do that shit. So it's almost a validation of I'm a better person, but I still get to kind of partake and and see what's going on, but I don't have to feel bad about it. Conflict is a huge motivator. The whole idea of consciousness is a very interesting thing. The theory of the mind. Like, I'm different. I'm, I'm the viewer. I can watch it. That's very fascinating, you know. I'm not the participant. How extreme can it go? How extreme can I handle before I'm like, I've reached my threshold? Our consciousness, our intelligence, can view things often as a game. Hello. I want to play a game. When picking a movie to watch, a lot of people think, you know, like, the more screwed up the movie is, the better it's going to be. If you're watching with a group of people, you want to see if you can, you know, freak out the people who you're watching the movie with. For horror fans, hardcore horror fans, we're so desensitized and we've seen so much stuff. We're just looking for that next level. For somebody to take it like even further, like do something we've never seen before. You know, we started out watching, you know, slashers in the 80s or, you know, whatever you came up, you know, watching. You know, especially when you get older, you want something that's gonna like pack you with that punch like when you were a kid mm -hmm. and everything was new to you. Anything you saw was fresh and different and mm -hmm. you had never seen it before. But now when you get older, you see the same stuff over and over and repeated and recycled. It's just that uh, you're looking for that next horror high kind of thing. And uh, a lot of that, a, a quick way to get it um, is through gore. And that's it. I mean, violence is a fast way to get a reaction. The more disgusting things you watch, the more, you know, the less disgusted you get. And me coming from backgrounds such as 4chan and, and Rotten and all these, you know, gory websites, I, there's not much that disgusts me. So I'm always looking for that, that thing that, you know, just makes me, makes my gut wrench because I haven't actually found it yet and even though you know there's some things like in, in the vomit gore uh, trilogy like the vomit there's that search to find something that you know wh where's where's my limit how fucked up am I and I think that's why a lot of the gore hounds are, are looking for to actually be disgusted they want to see more fucked up stuff because of the fact that it's it's just overwhelming it's that to need to know to discover to live through to experience your fears to find out that someone's suffering worse than you are suffering we're fully aware of the fact that it will all end eventually and it's in the back of our head subtly for so long that when you see the end of someone else's, you, you start looking and wanting to know, and you've got those questions that can't be answered because when you're dead, that's it. You don't get the answers. You really don't get to see that on a very regular basis, if at all. And I think that's a big draw. Once again, it's, it's that 
wanting to be exposed to something you almost never see. There's a lot of shock gore, like movies like Saw and Hostel and for, like those movies are more like gore for gore's sake and shock value. What I like is more like David Cronenberg, like body horror and Clive Barker looking at people as monsters and but monsters as beautiful, you know, beings. Jesus wept. <laughs> movies like Dead Alive that are more like, not campy, but just gross out gore, uh, that's more comedy. Well, first of all, we get uh, used to it. We get inured to it. We want to see more exploding heads. The creators are always wanting to up the stakes. This movie only had three murders. This movie has 900 murders. And I think that becomes a marketing tool as well. This is the most violent film. It becomes why certain categories of audience go to see the films. You're not going to see the film to find out about the relationship. You want to see the act of violence, the more intricate and more gross it is. That's just the genre. We like extremes. Uh, we like to push things as far as they can go. Uh, and we see this in all aspects of life. I was uh, watching an episode of Frasier the other night and they're talking about how many marshmallows you can stuff into somebody's mouth. And that's certainly on the much more benign end of the spectrum. But then we also have who can grow their nails the longest, who can grow the longest beard. We love going to extremes and seeing how far we can push things. And if you can apply that to something as benign as how long can you grow your nails, then it certainly applies to how many body parts can I chop off of this guy in this movie and how many gallons of fake blood can I spray around the set before it reaches a point of that's enough. Sometimes these really fucked up movies are a political statement. Um, I think a Serbian film was a political statement um, and they really just want to shock people and I think people want to see these disgusting things because they don't they get to see these things but they don't personally have to experience them and, you know, some people think that it's art, you know, August Underground, that's some really fucked up shit. And I'm, I think it releases adrenaline in your brain or there's some brain chemicals and it just makes you feel good and it just makes you want to push further and further. I, I know what you're thinking. This is a weird help, but I can handle it. <laughs> no. You're my fave. <laughs> Audiences like to watch strange people because uh, they're attracted to the aberrant. I mean, uh, for some reason, we've had freak shows for the, up until uh, the social justice warriors. Uh, uh, we've had uh, freak shows. When I was a child, f freaks were rich. They made a lot of money, the ones in the big circuses. My grandfather, was, who was in vaudeville, he was partners with uh, Zip the Pinhead. Zip the Pinhead was a famous uh, freak in Barnum and Bailey uh, Circus. Right, the Elephant Man. People are uh, turned on most when there's an interesting uh, and uh, entertaining uh, movie. You've got to have a catalyst. You've got to have something in the movie that is what makes the nasty shit happen. So I guess what better way than to have that person that you can almost cheer on? You know, it's, it's the one you love to hate. Obviously, your protagonist you know, the good guy or the final girl, or whoever, whatever, you, okay, the, and the hero or whatever. You, you need that. But, I mean, come on, let's face it. The real hero of any horror movie is the villain. I mean, the best mo movies, horror movies, have the best villains. Right. And watching somebody fucked up, or even if they're not the actual thing, but, but even side characters that are crazy or psychotic or out of the, um, they, they, you know, they add to the, color and personality you're like something bad's gonna right, happen right. now and, this guy and, and showed it's good up because it's not like a regular like a drama with the bad guy you know in a horror movie the bad guy is really the good guy i mean the bad you really do pull for him but everybody know? likes to watch the bad guy. that's why darth right. vader is so right infamous. i mean every bad guy is you know if you have a good yeah. bad guy that's why how, you know the joker i mean like the old you know one of the ultimate villains in, in anything it's like why does everybody love the joker because because you know, he's, he's crazy because you don't know what's coming not, next right. you can't predict what he's gonna do Ta -da! it's it's gone you could have friday the 13th part you know 99 you know everybody loves jason we would still watch it yeah i mean you'd still watch it because he's the best he's one of the best right. It's, slasher villains it's ever the character created. you're coming back for yeah you love you know you love him i know everybody gets mad at the people in the movie theaters yelling like don't go in that door don't run and do this i think you instantly put yourself in those scenarios 
and you kind of play it out in your head while the movie's going on of like what you would do in that scenario if there would be an escape or if you're just fucked pretty yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it's like secretly some people kind of want to just kill people. I'm serious. You know, I mean, like there's times I have like fantasies about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God almighty. In my estimation, it was always like, you know, adolescent boys who really liked these things because they were like feeling their testosterone surge. I don't think there's a real lot of people in assisted living places who are like 90 years old, you know, in Des Moines, Iowa, watching, you know, Saw 4, but maybe I'm wrong, you know. There's a big separation between object and subject. It's really fascinating. When you see a serial killer on TV or you see the forensics team or you see a mass murderer or you see Charlie Manson or you see fictional characters like a Michael, a Jason, a Freddy, even the tall man, you want to know what's inside their head while they're doing it. And for me, uh, especially in the last five years, abnormal psychology has been a big part of my life. So you want to understand what's in their head. You don't even exist to me. There's some little part inside of us that maybe just wants to get rid of people that get on our nerves or get rid of bullies, which a lot of slashers and bad guys are going after jerks and bullies and that kind of thing. To some degree, there's a little bit of, well, we can't really get this kind of vengeance in real life because we're humans and generally we care about each other. How about a kid, Santa Claus? It kind of feels good watching something terrible happen to this person who probably deserved it. He's sorry. Oh, he's sorry. He's sorry. Part of it is a sort of fantasy or wish fulfillment and another thing is a, a morbid curiosity to try to understand and analyze a, a person or being who is fundamentally broken. Fucking bitch! Ah! 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 You will listen to me! Are you clean? When someone uh, produces a, a film or a movie in which the central character is that sort of person. I don't need to wear those ugly shoes. I told you the kind I wanted. You ruined my friend. It's like a personal one-on-one -on -one visit with a zoo exhibit where you can sit there and you can watch it. You can see what's going on, but it's done at a safe dif distance. There's that boundary of the, the glass or the LED screen where it's just that you can get right in there. Sometimes shook up old ladies. Get. Would I want to be around those people in real life? No, but would I want to watch a movie about the people that I would want to be around in real life? Um, probably not. The people that I would want to be around in real life, I'd be watching a movie about people going to the movies and then sitting around and talking about them or playing video games or not killing and robbing and raping and pillaging. I you know, don't want to be around those people, but if I'm going to watch something, I want something that's going to be entertaining. I want something that's going to have a narrative to it. <laughs> I've heard people before talk about Michael Myers as a personification of the inevitability of death, more so than any other slasher villain. Uh, silence, implacable, uh, seemingly motivated by nothing more than just this desire to kill a specific target. It's very grim reapery. And so by humanizing that and putting it into a form that we can understand and even put a name to Michael Myers, it's a man's name, it's relatable, it's personal, it's something that we can then try and deal with. Even movies like American Psycho or uh, Henry a portrait of a serial killer. There's a little part in all of us <laughs> that's a little psycho. Most of us have thought about like ripping somebody's head off at least once. Just like a beast inside all of us that makes it fun to watch people be crazy and watch murders uh, happen because not like we would all act out on these uh, fantasies, but to acknowledge that it's okay to have them because we're all human. We like blood and gore and violence. It's, it's, nothing, it's nothing that just happened during the era of cinema in the last 130 years. You go back to British theater, for example, all the plays are full of suicides, violence, poisonings, rapes, hangings, 
terrible murders, eye gougings. In Shakespeare's plays, there's uh, human sacrifice. And the audiences loved that. They really went to the theater in Shakespearean times to see the gore. Some of it is revenge, and we'd like to revenge ourselves on our enemies, and we can't really do it in normal life. But, you know, I think that one thing that we forget is that um, the world itself is a pretty cruel place. So it's not like something somebody, some sick screenwriter or director made up. I mean, it really is, it is part of our DNA. I don't think it's a sign that people lack any kind of sympathy or empathy or anything like that. But I think when you realize this 7 billion people and how many countless people die and get killed in disgusting ways, and then you've got movies and we're kind of like celebrating, you know, that same disgusting, you know, nature. You know, if there's a car chase or if there's a scene in a, in a mall where someone's shooting someone, then they're shooting at everyone and all these people are dying, but no one cares. You have no connection to them whatsoever. People don't really care unless it affects them because people are selfish. It's not like sort of virtual reality or something. You know you're watching this movie. You have no emotional ties with these people whose body parts are flying all over the place. I mean, there is a part where it's difficult to watch like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan where you're seeing these people being hurt and it really does affect you. But when you see these bystanders, you know, you're like, I have no emotional investment in these people and I never will. I don't really care. So um, I think you just, I mean, that, <laughs> you just don't care. Sometimes that is better. You have an action sequence in a movie in which there's a high casualty rate. There's a chase scene or machine gun fire and a bunch of people are falling down and they're just kind of disappearing. I think the reason why we don't care is not a, um, a personal decision. I think it's a safety mechanism within the brain. You walk down the road in Los Angeles for you, for New York for me, or just in a neighborhood, how many of the people do you actually know? You know next to none of them. And that's the thing with it. Why would you put a care in there for them they're disposable. They're cookie cutters. And that's something that Hollywood has really tapped into. We don't make a connection to it that it's really that important. If we did, we wouldn't be watching it. We wouldn't, we, we'd be protesting like The Walking Dead right now. They're posting, protesting it's too violent because a couple people died really gory. Well, we don't talk about the living dead on that show and why they're dead and we're not protesting why there's dead people walking around and why rick is shooting them every single week no it's one of the most popular shows in the world why because we really don't care about those disposable characters and hollywood makes it where we only care about the main characters and everyone else is just a death sentence away we don't attach to a faceless crowd we attach to a human or a group of humans where we get to know their story one thing i found really interesting um in the Avengers, there were creatures coming down and there was mass destruction going on. They actually took time to assign one of the Avengers to work on ground control, to work on the crowds, to clear the area. Usually that doesn't happen. They're just like, blow it all up, blow up this building. We're going to go through this building. I thought it was really an interesting thing that they actually took the time to say, why don't we get people out of here first? You know, just because they might explode. Right. Star Trek did it. Star Wars did it. Every movie's done it. There's always, you know, a bunch of disposable extras, and they're there just to die, really, in, a, in depending on the movie. But that's that's what a lot of those people are there for. This is what you want to see. So if there's just like, you know, 500 people just getting blown away. I hate to say it, but we do see that on the news about every day. You know, right. we're accustomed to it. So it's it's just something that exists. So when we see it in a movie, we go in with the mindset it's fake. So who cares how many people die? <laughs> it's okay to be like, yeah, blowing up cars and hundreds of people are dying. But it's not like you don't care about some of those characters in the movies and feel bad. It doesn't mean it doesn't affect you. Some movies, you know, it's kind of ridiculous, even in True Lies. Like there's a comedic element. <laughs> <laughs> that laughter is often just an escape thing. Like we, we think that um, responses are, st are stereotypical. 
that we know how people react to things. And there's a proper way, like somebody dies and you should cry. But people um, have different ways of reacting to stress. Some people are quiet, some people laugh, some people cry. And I think one escape mechanism of horrible things are for people to minimize it because approaching it directly is so terrifying it would cause trauma. So some, some response to trauma is denial. And, and shutting down because that's a natural thing. Why do you want to keep reliving a horrible thing? And another response is to laugh, to minimize it, because it releases our tension and our stress. I'm sure that some of the people laughing are just really getting off on it. There's probably certainly people in every horror audience who, uh, who are genuinely amused by seeing human suffering. But then I think it's also sort of this uh, stress release response. Uh, it is seeing other people die it's not you. Yes, that would be horrible if it were happening. Uh, it always makes me think of uh, MASH. Uh, Alan Alda and uh, Trapper John or BJ cracking jokes over the bodies of soldiers that they're performing surgery on. If they really stopped and really thought about what was happening, it would be too overwhelming. It would be awful. It would be horrible. But because they're uh, making light of the situation, they're able to endure it. And by doing the same thing with watching death and suffering, it's allowing the audience to kind of deal with the idea of mortality and finality. Holy shit, people are dying, like this is really violent and laughing is kind of a way to kind of take a step back and be like, oh, I'm not really in this movie. Um, and, and it's some sort of like stress reliever. Like, I fucking laugh during death all the time. Instead of, you know, screaming, I laugh because, I don't know, it feels better to me to laugh and be like, oh my God, this is just a movie. So, and you know, this is kind of funny. Versus if I saw it in real life, I would definitely not be laughing, I would hope. Seeing, like, blood splattered and people killing each other and things like that, I not you don't necessarily want it to happen, but it's just interesting to be kind of confronted with something as entertainment that is are other people facing mortality and and it can it can be funny you know it's i think it's fun to laugh at things that we're scared of i guess everyone's entitled to one good scare huh? if it's something like a little more comical and you know that the director is trying to to make something to kind of put a smile on your face mm -hmm. like it's kind of like he's winking at you through what he's doing in the movie or she's doing through the movie Someone's being decapitated while also experiencing like an orgasm. <laughs> it's just like now saying it and we laugh. That's a good example of it. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so absurd too. Like when it gets, here's the line and you, you know, not just cross, you like pull vault off, you know, over the line. It's just, you can't help but laugh at how ridiculous it is. Sometimes it's purposefully funny. Horror comedy things, dead alive. There we go, that's a good one. Uh, where it's just so over the top that you're like, oh, that gore is completely ridiculous. Come on, it's ridiculous. And, and we love it because it's ridiculous. It makes us laugh. Comedy in general is uh, comes out of surprise. Sometimes it's just, oh my God, that's so ridiculous. And then we laugh. I don't know that people find death and gore hilarious. I think people find uh, Charlie Chaplin uh, slapstick uh, funny. The Three Stooges are certainly funny when they poke each other in the eyes. Uh, it's cartoon violence. Tom and Jerry, a uh, big inspiration for uh, the trauma movies. Uh, I think it's the way we're built. I think it's a, 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 evolution has uh, given humans a way to uh, shield themselves from, uh, from physical violence and then from mental violence. And uh, perhaps there is a, a, a trigger in our brain that uh, when the violence is a cartoony violence, uh, rather than get upset by it, uh, we, we want to laugh at it and laugh in its face. You see people die with like getting glass, like in ghosts. When the window glass comes down on him. It's just creative. And it, it makes death more lighthearted and maybe not as scary when you're like, well, this would never happen in real life. Like, you know, this, this shit doesn't happen. And so that's just another way for like maybe 
the morbid curiosity, but to, then, you know, being able to take a step back and be like, you know what, that really doesn't ever happen. It's not necessarily because the person is an insensitive creep. It's because the, the feeling of terror is too much to express. It's like the audacity of the right. thing. Like you see it and you just go, oh, you, you know, right. it's almost like, are you fucking serious? But you're cheering it on yeah, in a way. Yeah, you as are, well. but you're, but it's funny. You just laugh because, because it's nasty, but it, it, it is You funny. have to release, your body has to release something from, right. because of what you're watching. And I don't know, for me, it's just automatically going to be a laugh most of the time. Or I mean, you see like somebody's head getting stomped and the, like the brain squirting out. You know, right. Say, for example. You laugh because you, you know, like You're not it. really going to be like, ah! Like the Japanese movies, they go like with the blood. They go like like far over the than top. Any, any American filmmakers, any Western filmmakers. They must have better They hearts. cut an arm off and it's just like, you know, 87 gallons of blood come out. Like, <laughs> and it's like, you know, and it's funnier. And it's funny. <laughs> Because it's so over the top, and it is very nasty, but it's, right. it's hilarious because it's just, because it's so extreme. I mean, really, I mean, I'll watch the funny, the nastiest shit, and I'll just start cracking up just because it's... Because you're digging it. But right? I'm digging it. I'm yeah. appreciating it. Appreciating it. And, and I'm having fun. I'm being entertained. Right. It's entertainment. Yeah. There you go. The bottom line is, it's just entertainment. Fucked up entertainment. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Want a sucked face? No. <laughs> Most of them have some sort of personality, especially people like Freddy Krueger, who's, you know, he's he's funny. <laughs> he's he's like psychotically funny, and he has all these good one-liners, and you just love to look at him and watch him and hear him speak. Um, then there are killers like in in Maniac, uh, the original, where I would never fall in love with him but you know he's he has he also has that kind of nastiness that kind of draws you to him the bad guys tends to be so much more charismatic than the good guys uh, very rarely do you have a uh, franchise of any sorts especially in horror uh, where it's the good guy that you're following you know we don't have Nancy from a nightmare on Elm Street coming back that many times she's in number one and then she's in number three and she dies in number three and that's the last we really see of her it makes it physically easier to fall in love with someone who's in the process of like disemboweling someone else. Sorry, you lose! <laughs> ah! 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 Look hot while they're doing it. <laughs> nice dance. People are always drawn to the forbidden. If you're not supposed to like them, then you're probably gonna like them. When those women fall in love with the dudes that are in prison, <laughs> there's like this like perceived romance with the violence. If it's a sexy actor, sure, there is some sort of sexuality and violence in some way. And you know, being a victim, that's kind of a, a sexual thing. Like, an, I don't know if it's like an S and M thing, but you know, maybe it's a fantasy for people. And you know, you're seeing these guys do this, and you're just like. Hot. Corn syrup. All the horror staple, like the, the main villain dudes, you know, they're all good looking guys. You know, they're all in a special way. I mean, how could you not fall in love with like a, a face like this? Freddy Krueger is so witty, you know? Girls always go for the funny guys. You would just ignore Freddy Krueger's like horrifically burned body because he's funny as shit and he has confidence. That's all you need in a man. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. I don't think that art should ever have limits placed on it from the outside, unless you're talking about, like, actually killing somebody on film or, you know, molesting or harming a child on film. I, I don't think that that should be allowed, but in terms of working within the framework of fiction and you've got consenting actors who are simulating things, I don't think that you should have limits placed on you. I feel that there probably is a line there somewhere, but could I say what that line is? I can't give you a hard definition, but I would know it when I saw it. Especially in horror films and, and true crime films, there is some stuff out there that's very dangerous. Author Jack Ketchum, for example, he has created some of the most 
disturbing horror fiction. And a lot of people consider him to be the scariest man in the world. But at the same time, he also understands when to reel it in. You see the aspect of Wes Craven when he was alive, the last house on the left. He created something really scary, really terrible. But at the same time, he knew when to reel it in and he had a conscience about what it was, especially after the uh, disembowelment scene, how they all took a, a lunch and they all separate from each other to get that kind of downtime. There are filmmakers that are very dangerous, but at the same time, I think they have the power to do both. And that's why they're unique in what they can do. As long as everything is done in a safe manner and nothing is being exploited and there's no needless harm or killing of both people or animals, I think everything in filmmaking is completely fair game. And if uh, a filmmaker or a director or a producer is willing to go as far as actually cause injury or harm to a living creature, then I think it just stops being filmmaking. And then I think it's just this person's a sicko and they're using the camera as an excuse to do something. Oh, Jesus, what is this? There's something beautiful about seeing, you know, what's on the inside, on the outside. And there's something terrifying about death, not just because it's a horror film. You could have a horror film that doesn't have any, like, death or gore, and it could still be a horror film, depending on how it's, it's done. And then there's other movies where you write it in because it's this fantasy you've had um, as a revenge killing. Like in Dolly Deadly, you want to come up with something, like, how would a kid try to kill someone? It's a way of being creative. It's a creative exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Some of it's comedic, but mostly it's really to get the point of a story across. So depending on what kind of tale you're telling, sometimes death is important to include. There was a movie, I can't remember the name of it. It was some nasty gore flick, but there was a kid in it who was like two. And there's a scene where he's watching his mom or somebody get beat up badly and hurt. And I had to stop watching because I'm watching this kid shrieking in terror and freaking out. And I'm like, well, maybe he was fine afterwards, but that was traumatic to that child. Filmmakers can do what they want as long as nobody's hurt, but I think they will have a better film if they keep in mind storyline, characters that people care about, because that's important, and uh, the dynamics. It can't just be the volume up the whole time or it's not extreme, it's dull. We did some crazy shit to our actors, but we talked to them all beforehand. In detail. We, in detail what we're gonna do, and they were, and they knew what was going on. Don't do any bullshit, because that's too far if you try to pull some crap on an actor beforehand, right. and then they're there And then the it really does become snuff. I mean, not to the point where you've killed somebody, right. but when you do something that's not discussed, that's where you can cross the right. line. I think the limit's changing every day. You know, when somebody comes out with, you know, this movie and they do this in it, that affects maybe a decision that someone else makes down the road. You know, you just keep getting crazier and crazier. If you want to go there, go there. But when you go to make it, everybody involved has to know what you're doing. So there's full disclosure and you're not putting anybody on the spot. And, and you got to make sure everybody's comfortable. You know, they're not then don't try to force them to do anything they don't want to do because that's bullshit. You need to be straight up, say, this is what we're going to do. Are you okay with that? And then if they're not, they'll tell you. Right. If they are, and great, you... let's, let's film it. Right. Let's do it. You've heard the expression, it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. That, I think, can be applied to the gory movie scene. Just in and of itself, they're not taboo or anything. Otherwise, we wouldn't have movies like Hostel or Saw be so like popular in the mainstream. In that race to kind of like one up each other, you can probably go too far. That line is when put in a situation they didn't ask to be put in for the sake of the gore. If, it, if the people involved are in an uncomfortable situation or a situation they don't want to be in, mm -hmm. that would pretty much be taking it too far. As far as a director's <laughs> vision and stuff, go for it. It's art and art you really can, can do whatever and you're always going to have people say that um oh this is just for shock value this is grotesque and um i really think as long as there's not really someone being hurt like that's too far like snuff and stuff like that's that's too far but i really think that you can kind of do whatever you want and some people are going to say it's trash some people are going to say that it that it is art oh.
no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. There are times when it's more fun to watch uh, death and disaster and violence and nasty things. Like, I don't want to see it if, if I've just had a rough day. Unless it's a rough day where I'm pissed off at somebody and then I kind of want to see somebody get it who totally deserves it because then it feels better. Horror was therapeutic for me about six years ago when I had a really bad breakup and all I did was watch horror. I had no cable TV. I just, and, and you know, this is going to be sad for all the people of the VHS era, but the stores were liquidating. West Coast video, Hollywood video, Blockbuster video, all liquidating, mom and pop shops, all liquidating. So I got a hold of VHS and DVDs and I opened my eyes to Asian horror, opened my eyes to a lot more gory stuff. It made me, it made me get past fears I had had before about watching it really extreme stuff about five plus years ago. And all because it was therapeutic, all because I was in the mood to really kind of push myself and get out of the mindset and the headspace I was in. And nowadays watching it, I sit back and I watch a lot of films and, and most of them I enjoy very much. I, I have a very open mind, but there's times where I'll put on one and I'll go, no, nah, I'm just not in the mood for this. I need something more brutal or I need something more sweet or I need something more cerebral or I need a true crime. It's very much about mood. It's very much about the aspect of mindset that goes into it for me as well as many others. And that's usually a big factor on whether films succeed or they fail. You know, if you're just in a mood where you're like, Ugh, I want to punch the world in the face today. Yeah, then it's kind of fun. We know horror to be like typically something that's supposed to like scare you or mortify you or something like that. We also know there's another side to that, a completely opposite side to that. I don't know if it's just because we're sick in the heads or something, but we actually do find horror movies to be therapeutic in a sense. One of my comfort movies, I mean, I could name a whole bunch of them, but definitely Evil Dead too. That would be something that no matter what type of shitty day I've had or what type of mood I'm in, if I throw that on, I can just kick back, relax, and it, it puts you in a trance. Evil Dead 2 is perfect. Groovy. At least in my own personal experience, I put horror on when I am sort of depressed, <laughs> which is weird. You would think it would have some sort of opposite reaction, but I think because I see these people in these horrible situations in these films, it kind of relieves any sort of anxiety that I'm feeling because thank fuck that I, you know, am not in that situation. So, you know, I'm okay. These people aren't okay. So I'm okay. So that kind of, as fucked up as that sounds, puts me almost in a better mood. Terrorvision is probably like the one that sits right up on top. Is so good. Yeah, I could throw that on and it's it's still violent. It's still got gore. Some really nice gore actually. Like nice all, uh, monster gore. But um yeah, I can watch that one and fall asleep. <laughs> because it's like being wrapped in a uh, really disgusting bloody blanket. It's just very very comforting. Most people associate gore with things that happen in movies and not in real life. I think there's a quite a big difference in real life, torture and gore. I've noticed that a lot of people actually separate those two things more than I thought they did. 3,000 years ago, if you were watching some guy getting his head sawn off in a desert somewhere, odds were you were 6, 12 feet away, or you were the guy who was doing it. You were standing right there, and you were seeing this for real. You were smelling the blood. You were hearing this guy's last gasps in person. If you're watching it on YouTube or you're watching it online, you're very removed from it. You're getting that death experience, but you're not getting the hands-on experience of it. And so you've just watched somebody's life end, and then you can click over to a poker game or do whatever you're doing and you don't have that real intimacy of the experience and it's allowing for I think this very disturbing trend of desensitization. Maybe if that's all you watched and you just sat in a room for eight hours a day every day watching nothing but like the bloodiest most violent twisted films you could think of I certainly think that's going to reshape the human mind after a while. Right now I am for the thousandth time in a row watching the Hannibal series. 
And there's a couple of scenes in that, like I just watched the one with Molly Shannon, where she's heading this kind of cultish family of children, these little boys that she brings up and she's turning them against their own families and they're killing, but they're very serious about it, which if it was in a trauma film, maybe it'd be kind of funny, but because of the atmosphere of the film, it's all I can think is as a mom, I'm like, oh my God, that's heartrending. Hey, look, there were um, 8,000 you know, instances this month on TV of murders and like three instances of breasts and you're nobody saying you should stop that. I, I think it's ubiquitous in, in, in present day culture. I mean, the, the, the pictorialization of violence is, is all over the place. And video games are replete with violence, you know, superhero fantasies, but violence. So I think it's, it's pretty common in society. People enjoy it. It's strange. I just saw Alien Covenant, which was, you know, had lots of gore and, and horror and suspense. <laughs> And I was kind of like hiding my eyes like a baby and he was watching it straight on. He said, well, I just think it's fake and I just look for the special effects. So, so I think you can look at it that way. Um, I think it's all about your personal experience. During our everyday lives, as we're wandering around, we are bombarded with messages, thousands of messages every day. And if we actually acutely paid attention to every single instance of that, we We'd be overloaded, we'd probably self-destruct, we certainly wouldn't get anything done. People like to actually believe that this stuff only happens in movies. Like maybe they try to separate it. It's naughty and it's dirty and it's dangerous. Like you wanna, you watch the movies to see that stuff, but you really don't wanna see that shit in real life, do you? I think the thing about it is the fact that you know it's not real, though you're not going into it, oh, that's not real, that's not real. You're watching it and you're like, oh, you have that safety net, don't you? Bottom line is this, you know, you're in your house or you're in a theater, you're eating popcorn, you're sitting in the house having a beer, but you're in your own environment. And, and it's as horrible as it is, you're, you still are in control. <laughs> It's it, different. it is different because it's very different. If you think it's the same, then you got something wrong with you. You know, it is right. definitely different. You know, everybody that I've met and come into contact with that does this and makes horror movies and enjoys horror movies are the most nicest people, you know, except Tom that you'll ever meet. You know, right. so it's I don't know. You know, unless you're some kind of you are a fucked up human being. Most people have good hearts, and most people are good. You might actually be seeing a sort of human de-evolution. We've got an internet troll and they're posting online and they're getting these negative responses from people that it triggers a, a dopamine release in the brain, that it's uh, the same as activating the, uh, the reward center of the brain. And I think similarly, if you do have this part of the human brain that is there to allow you to experience human suffering, it can be activated by a movie and it can be activated by a violent television show and you can access that in a healthy way, but it can also be activated by the thing that was meant to activate in the first place, which is real death and suffering. If when I was growing up at the age of three, if I started watching the Today Show and CNN and MSNBC with all that real violence, and then it was interrupted by drugs that make you feel good and, and uh, make you, uh, feel like you're in a safe space. And I didn't grow up in that atmosphere. I grew up in an atmosphere of, of Rogers and Hammerstein and going to Yale University and all the bourgeois luxuries of life. And I still think about blowing my fucking brains out every day. And if you see Terra Firmer, you'll see that uh, that's one of the themes of the movie. Because the real violence is what, what the major media and the mainstream come up with is sicker than anything that Stephen King could possibly come up with. I've been in a few, like two short films, uh, but the first one I was in, I wasn't killed, and uh, that kind of made me a little bit sad. I really wanted to kind of die and get that gory death. Every actor wants to have that awesome death scene. It's like, uh, oh, I can gasp and choke and fall down better than anyone else that could do it. It's like some weird, sort of inside competition thing for everyone else. The special effects are really cool to like get, you know, put on and stuff and it just makes the experience 
it gives you a different experience than just surviving because that's what we do in real life. I don't want to die. I will one day. But we, I don't think we want to die. But there's something about playing out this act of death as kids, like playing with guns. And, and it's this fun experience of falling over and taking a last breath and coughing and just your interpretation and getting to experience acting out dying, I think is uh, something fascinating for a lot of people. And plus gore. I mean, a lot of people are into horror are like, oh, good, I get to, you know, spit blood out of my mouth when I cough or, you know, so there, I don't know, there's all kinds of exciting elements because you get to really act out this moment in life, your last moment to a crowd and try to be effective. I think it's a challenge because you don't actually know what it's like. To be able to be killed and put through your own death and your own funeral is something that's so surreal. And I believe that these actors um, sit back and they want to experience that at least once in their lives. And you might not necessarily like the makeup of it, but the people that are around you, they're, they're, they're making you part of their art. Plus it's just fun to play and be like a kid again. Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? <laughs> I, I think that's a fairly new phenomenon. Uh, I, on my fan site, LloydKaufman.com, it's like every day somebody says, I want to be killed in one of your movies. And actually, there are quite a number of celebrities who I meet who uh, who want to be killed in a trauma movie. I'm not too eager to be killed in a trauma or in any movie because that blood is very sticky and, uh, and it stains, uh, although you can wash it out. It's really not that pleasant to be killed in a... Uh, in a movie, especially a trauma movie, where uh, Citizen Toxie, I think we used more blood than uh, any movie ever, except Peter Jackson's uh, uh, um, Brain Dead. He says he used more blood in Brain Dead than we used in Citizen Toxie, uh, but I think that's open open to debate. I get to die, like I get to have blood all over me and stuff, but not really. And it's you know, and I, I know a lot of actors kind of in the moment they do get kind of scared, you know. And I think that that's an adrenaline rush for them. And I think it's funny for them to be able to watch the film and, you know, see themselves as a dead person. But, you know, they're sitting on the couch watching this movie. And so I definitely understand um, kind of wanting to see that. Because, you know, everyone's obsessed with their own death and mortality. And so this is, you know, kind of a way to experience a death without really having to die yet. I would love to die in a movie. <laughs> I guess this is the big climax. Hope you don't mind if I fake it. Oh, look at me. I'm all dead. Uh, on our level, just our little small little movies, I've had, like, I've written, you know, a character or something, and I, you know, they'll read it and they'll love it and they'll say, hey. Why does you know, he die? Uh, yeah, well, how come I didn't die? You know, like, goes, you know again, I want to die. It's like people want right. to be killed. But it goes hand in hand as well. Like a horror movie, immediately you're going to think death. And immediately you're going to think, oh, do I get to die? Like it's part of it. Like it's it's like if you did a comedy, you'd have to tell some funny jokes. And it's not just dying. People want to be... It's want, the mess people, of it. But people want to die horribly. Messy. Like yeah. they don't want to just like, you know, do, uh, and die. Right. They want, you know, oh, you know, they, like, they're like excited to get blood put on them like right. when you're setting it up okay we're gonna do this and, oh yeah oh you want to say yeah, yeah yeah pour it on me yeah yeah do it yeah yeah it really hit me with, like, like they want to get dirty like they love getting blood put all it's over a them. horror movie it's it's and, it's because there's no there are no limits like it, the possibilities are endless in a, in a horror movie so maybe that people just get excited like oh i get to become this and do this and die like this it's right. just different i've been on both ends of that killing and being killed and I think I like killing more because it's fun to be arr, vicious. I like the gore. I like playing in it because it's it's hilarious. Then I spend the next week stained pink from the blood. But that's okay because I earned it. <laughs> Plus, it's just getting out some any aggression I might have built up over the week. That dude who cut me off or that telemarketer that's getting on my nerves. I could just think about them and. Arr. Let's get hot. Irreversible. The fire hydrant scene, almost impossible for me to watch. 
One, because it looks so damn real. And two, because repeated violence, like just over and over again. That kind of stuff, especially to the face, that will get me cringing. Maybe that's not the goriest movie I've seen, but it definitely had probably one of the hardest hitting moments, you know, gore-wise in any movie I've like ever seen. And Final Destination, when uh, the girl's talking and she just steps out in the street and the bus just blam goes and hits her. I actually laughed when I saw that in theaters. Just drop fucking dead. <laughs> the one that actually sticks out more than anything is actually the movie called Dr. Giggles. There's this scene that really disturbed me where he cuts a woman up and just hides inside of her. <laughs> that was a really fucked up scene for me and it took me days to get over that. But it's one of the cheesiest, stupidest horror movies that you, you would probably ever see. But it's just that one particular scene just stood out in my mind more than anything. I believe it's Kane Hodder's Jason took the girl in the sleeping bag and slammed her against the trees. And the reason why is because on MTV they gave Jason Voorhees a Lifetime Achievement Award when they did the movie awards. And that was the scene that they showed for it. <laughs> from Aftermath, the, the shirt I'm wearing, because it's just so real. The corpse on the table when he's opening her, her up and the anatomy of, of a human being is so disgusting. And, you know, seeing it just there, light open. You can't really see his face. He has the mask on and he's just like digging in there. It's quite sexy in a way. The, the passion he had looking at this dead body and all the gore was just fantastic. It just, it just made me tingle. Yellow Brick Road, all one word. Kind of like Blair Witch, like there's something supernatural going on. A guy and his sister, you know, start getting an argument and he literally takes a rock and smashes her leg and just like rips off her leg. And it's so bizarre in the film because nothing violent had happened um, up to that point. It had just been like kind of creepy. And then there's like this out of the blue explosive violent scene where you're like what the fuck did i just see that it's just you know something that just explodes in your face because you're just like wow i have seen thousands of deaths trash dying and returning the living dead both titillating and horrifying at the same time it's that emotional roller coaster of those visual cues going back and forth oh you know what's you know what's a fucking great oh my god i love this dude in death proof when he does the head-on collision oh, with the girls. Oh, man, that car wreck. Oh, and her leg. Yeah, that's good. Oh, dude, and her leg, man, when they, they, they show it a bunch of times. I think that's so leg. shocking because it's a real scenario. Dude, that's a great you know, fucking A car scene. wreck. Good one. That's a good one. Oh. And now they're all coming out. Quint in Jaws. Jaws, oh, that, shit. And the shark gets him. Yeah. And he's like, ah! But again, like it's not there. super, super, super gory, but it's wow, very, very yeah, realistic. That's really, that that's, that's good. That's, that's a good one. one. What yeah. about that scene of Friday the 13th with the... You mean Nightmare on Elm Street? Uh, what did I say, Friday the 13th? <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street, I'm all... Uh, Nightmare, on Elm, Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, yeah. Part three. Dream Warriors. Dream Warriors. Yeah. Dream... I'm going to sing for you. Dream Warriors. Was that the actual theme song? Oh, yeah, yeah, Kill, yeah, yeah. Just kills with the tendons. Well, the uh, way that movie worked is that they had these vulnerable children that were supposed to be suicidal. So Freddy's kills, right? He, 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 you know, slit his own wrists, but yet no, he was really turning him into a puppet, and then to make him look like he jumped out the window. Yeah, so a, a nasty, gory kill, but also a really creative one. Nasty. Why do we like this stuff? <laughs> what? What are we? <laughs> what are we crazy? Oh, that's a good question. John Carpenter's The Thing. I love The Thing, and that movie is gory as all get out. I really liked when they are working on one of the corpses. And it fakes a heart attack, and they've got him on the gurney, and the doctor goes to uh, put the, the shock pedals on his chest, and then his chest opens up and chops off the doctor's arms. Ah! And then he starts thinking out, and then uh, Kurt Russell's got the flamethrower, and it's just pandemonium. He informs a spider where the body is the upside down head. It is so bizarre looking. I love it so much because it's just so weird. I've always loved the scene where the guy's head blows up. I think we all do. But I loved just wondering how they did that because obviously they didn't make a real head explode. Uh, at least that's what I thought when I was a kid. And then later you find out you're like, oh, makes sense.
One of the most powerful death scenes in a movie certainly is uh, the young boy on the bicycle uh, who gets his head squashed by the wheel of an automobile that's in the first Toxic Avenger movie. Um, so many directors have said that that uh, changed their whole view of cinema because it is uh, very violent. I mean, it's so violent that the bad people in the car, they back up and run over the kid's head a second time, which uh, is unbelievable. But it's uh, very much inspired by Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It made a huge, huge, huge in 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 impression on me. The guy keeps getting different limbs cut off, and he kind of doesn't even notice it, and he keeps talking. I mean, it's hilarious. Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. It's just a flesh wound. Look, stop that. Chicken. Chicken! Look, I'll have your leg. Right! I'll do you for that. You what? Come here! And it's yeah, it's extremely violent. Were it not distributed by United Artists or one of the big studios, that film would have been chopped up like crazy. All right. We call it a draw. The only thing that kind of makes me squeamish is the is nails. I don't like nails ripping off. Like I'm, I'm okay with most things. It's just so painful. Uh, you can feel it. Uh, you know, if you get you know that little splinter or something under your nail, it's just got yeah. It's really painful, and I think that kind of shows also in, in films when they like rip them off or stick something under them. I think people like being grossed out because then they can turn it off and it's fine, but just for a second you're just like, ah, and it maybe releases some sort of adrenaline or you're thinking, I'm sure as fuck glad that that's not happening to me. I can watch it like this. Too much excess blood. And I say that because you have so much excess of blood and it becomes a sensory issue where it's like vertigo, where you can't keep your balance, at least for me. I can't keep my, my mindset focused, and I start to feel nauseous. <laughs> and not a lot of things disturb me. However, though, you throw Hostel in front of me years ago, I couldn't watch the tendon cutting scene because it just really made me cringe. <laughs> It's hard to watch. That kind of makes me squeamish. Excessive blood. The aspect of those very sensitive moments. And over the years, I've gotten better, more desensitized, but still it gets me. Actually, not just horror movies. Every time I'm watching a movie, they always seem to throw a dead kid in there. <laughs> like Pumpkinhead. I'll kind of fast forward through the beginning. <laughs> With the little boy dying. I'm like, mm -hmm. I know it happens. I don't need to watch the heartbreak because I relate to it too closely and it freaks me out. Oh, another thing that just makes me, I have to watch through my fingers, teeth. Anything with teeth. I watched it, but I watch it like this. I'm like, mm, no, teeth pain, I hate that. We did it in Night of the Door where you get, you know, an eyeball gets stabbed out or teeth get pulled out. You know, people have a thing. Mine's babies. Boy, that sounded really bad. The thing I don't like to see happen is... My well, baby fetish. I have a baby fetish. Do you have no, anything? No, no I don't. I mean, do you no, have I something? know you mean. A lot of times, something could be super gory or disgusting and not be so squeamish. But something uncomfortable can make you squeamish because it's making you so uncomfortable. Right. Like, if you walked in and somebody grabbed a baby and slit the baby's throat... Oh, no. no. That would be like... We can't do that. Uh, that would... You know, or even like you thought he did it, and you hear the baby gurgling or something. No, no. That way. would be, that would fuck me up. Like, I, I would, would I'd be like, any, I, I would, don't want to see that. I would like to think like, that, that would fuck anybody up. Yeah, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, might, that might not, but that would be something you say squeamish. That would make me like, oh, But no, is I it, can't. I don't know that the gore is the stuff that makes you that's squeamish. What I mean. that's, what the, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the bill it's not so much the gore. You see a show, like a surgery show, and they're showing a surgery. It's like, ah! I can't. Know, it's like, you know, but because you see it's the real. same thing in a movie yeah. where they're cutting somebody open. Right. It's like, it's not a big deal. But right. yeah, you see a thing where they're like slicing into an abdomen. I don't watch that. If that's like, on oh. TV, I'll keep going. We get addicted to it, the images, and we want to be rewarded with more and more. We want to see the violence get more and more gruesome. There always has to be more. 